Okay, what this chart does, it takes us through the basics of sodium homeostasis. And homeostasis means the body wants to maintain sodium at a certain balance level. What's it going to do when it gets out of that level? What's going to cause it to get out of that level? What are going to be effects of getting out of that balance? And then why do we care about sodium in general? So to hit that point one more time, we're going to go through why does sodium matter? We're going to go through what, what is it called when sodium is too low or too high? What are the causes of sodium getting too low or the causes of it getting too high? What are the effects of sodium getting too low or getting too high? And we're also going to talk about how the body corrects these imbalances. What are the mechanisms the body has to correct those imbalances? If we look down here at the lower left corner, we're going to go through some of the things that sodium does in the body, things that we've learned about in AMP1 and AMP2 that relate to sodium. Probably the first one we'll point out is the sodium potassium ATPase. The sodium potassium ATPase pumps three sodiums outside of a cell and two potassiums back into the cell in every cell of the body. It generates a voltage, and in some cells, like the pacemaker, the heart, cardiac muscle, neurons and muscle, it generates action potentials that allow the body to signal something really, really quickly with a voltage change. So sodium is pretty important then in setting how fast the heart beats, how hard the heart beats, how neurons work, and how muscles work. Another thing is, is the glucose transporter. When a cell needs to get glucose inside, often what it'll do is it'll take advantage of the fact that the sodium potassium ATPase has put a lot of sodium outside the cell. And it'll let that sodium come back in. It wants to diffuse back in. The glucose transporter will let that sodium come back in as long as it brings a glucose with it. Bare receptors generally in the aorta or in the carotid, are used to sense blood pressure, and those are essentially sodium receptors. Macular densa cells, hypothalamus, fluid levels, loop of Henle, pituitary, um, these are all things that help regulate sodium balance. So macular densa cells are in the kidney, specifically in the nephron. Hypothalamus regulates thirst. Fluid levels, loop of Henle is where we take up sodium. Pituitary senses sodium concentrations to regulate osmolarity, so the concentration of your plasma, and then also how much sodium you have. And that's going to release ADH, which we'll learn about in a second, is going to cause an increase in, in water uptake. Another key thing about sodium is it drives uptake in the proximal convoluted tubule. When we go through the kidney, we talk about how you make 180 liters of filtrates, and you need to get that back into the blood system, otherwise you're going to lose it out into the urine. The primary way a lot of that gets back in is sodium is pumped from the filtrate into the blood, water follows the sodium, and then other things follow that water. So it all starts with the sodium. So sodium is pretty important in the body, obviously. Let's next then go through, what are the names? Real simply, if sodium levels get too low, it's called hyponatremia. If sodium levels get too high, it's called hypernatremia. Okay, let's look at the causes then next. And we'll drop down and look at hyponatremia first. Let's look first at diet. Obviously diet, if you consume too little sodium in your, in your diet, you're going to get hyponatremia. You can also technically consume too much water, and that would dilute the sodium. Other things like drugs or even estrogen can cause you to hold too much water, retain water. That also will dilute out the sodium, causing hyponatremia. Certain types of diuretics work by preventing the body from getting sodium back from the urine. And then when the sodium passes into the urine, it takes water with it. And this is going to reduce fluid level in the body. However, you might lose too much sodium when taking diuretics, and that would also cause hyponatremia. Aldosterone is responsible for helping sodium get out of the distal convoluted tubule. If you have a problem making, aldoster if you have a problem making aldosterone, because there's a problem with the adrenal cortex or simply, something simply holding up the renin system. Remember that the liver, the capillaries, and the lungs, the sympathetic nervous system all have input as to whether renin becomes aldosterone. If anything holds it up, you will not make aldosterone. Without aldosterone or hypoaldosteronism, you take up less sodium and you get hyponatremia. Lastly, if there's a problem with the posterior pituitary, there could be trauma or something like that, so you're making too much ADH, you'll take up too much water, and this will dilute the sodium and cause hyponatremia. For some reason, nausea also increases ADH production, and this can dilute out the sodium. Now let's look at the causes of hypernatremia. When you sweat, technically you're losing water that's pure, or less concentrated than the fluid inside of you, or the fluid that's in your interstitial space. Since you're losing water faster than salt, you're concentrating that salt and causing hypernatremia. You have other sources of water loss, too. In a very dry environment, you'll lose fluid through respiration, diarrhea, and all of these, if you lose water faster than sodium, it will lead to hypernatremia. Ingesting too much sodium will also cause hyponatremia, although ADH is very good usually at offsetting any increase in sodium. If you do inhibit that ADH, whether it's alcohol or diabetes insipidus, and that can be either by damage, which is called central diabetes insipidus, or it could be that the nephron just isn't responding to ADH. In either case, lack of ADH means lack of water uptake, which means you're going to concentrate your sodium and cause hyponatremia. In hypoaldosteronism, your endocrine system produces too much aldosterone, so you'll take up too much sodium, leading to hypernatremia.
Next up, let's talk about what will happen in hyponatremia and hypernatremia. And we'll start with hyponatremia over here. The first main effect is going to be on the size of the cell. And it's probably easy to say, well, that's only the size of the cell. But this is actually going to have some fairly profound effects. Obviously, if the size of the cell is bigger, then this causes pressure in confined spaces. I'm thinking cranial cavity. So it's going to cause the brain to swell. So in hyponatremia, cells will swell because the water will go towards the higher concentration of solvent inside the cell. And cells are going to gain water. So if you reduce the amount of sodium, it means the cells are in a hypotonic solution. It's less concentrated outside the cell as it is in. And water moves towards concentration. So water will move towards the more concentrated inside of the cell and cause these cells to swell. Like I said, if that cell is in a confined space like the brain or a structured organ like the liver, this is going to cause damage. Also, inside of each of these cells, there's hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions occurring per second. And in those chemical reactions, some chemical A needs to find some chemical B and combine in order to do something presumably important. If the cell is swollen up a little bit, A is further away from B now, and all chemical reactions in the body are going to slow down. Next, I'm going to talk about a cluster of effects that affect the voltage of the cell. Specifically, low sodium makes cells hyperpolarized. And the reason it is, is because the normal resting potential of a cell includes a certain amount of sodium leaking into the cell, and that results in the usual minus 70 millivolt resting potential. If there's not enough sodium around to leak into the cell, then the inside of the cell becomes more negative or hyperpolarized. Excitable cells then, things like neurons, cardiac cells, muscle cells, are going to be less likely to fire, and that will depress the nervous system. It can slow down the heart rates and decrease contractility in weakened muscles. Also, since we're weakening muscles and the muscles are required for the respiratory system, breathing might also be altered. Another thing to keep in mind is that since sodium is fairly closely tied to fluid, this lack of sodium can lead to a decrease in overall fluid volume. That's going to decrease blood pressure. Another thing to mention is something we mentioned over here, that sodium drives reuptake in the proximal convoluted tubule. Remember when we talked about kidney function, we talked about how you filter everything smaller than a protein, and then you have to take back what you want to keep. You have to get it out of that filtrate and back to the blood. And much of the ability to get back what you want out of that filtrate and get it back into the blood is dependent on first moving sodium from the filtrate back to the blood. Water then will follow the sodium. And other things like vitamins, glucose, minerals, amino acids will move to follow that water. They'll move back into the blood. So imbalances in sodium can disturb the ability to reabsorb things you want to keep from the filtrate. So if there's low sodium, you increase the ability to take things back up. That, of course, sounds good. And the reason it increases is because if there's less sodium in the blood, it's easier for the sodium potassium ATPase to pump sodium from the filtrate into the blood. That's going to be easier than to move water and move everything else. Now, again, that sounds good, but remember the kidneys are not perfect at this. And if reabsorption increases, this can also include reabsorption of things you don't really want to reabsorb, like urea. Essentially, then, too little sodium is a form of kidney failure because you're reabsorbing things back into the blood that you actually would like to pass into the urine. Let's look at hypernatremia. And these will be somewhat related to the effects of hyponatremia. Where a cell swelled in hyponatremia, cells will shrink in hypernatremia. Clearly, this does not really affect confined spaces, but it does affect the speed of those chemical reactions. So again, if a chemical reaction, so again, if a chemical reaction requires A to find B, A and B will now be closer together, and all the chemical reactions in the body will speed up. Too much sodium will also affect the excitability of cells. It will make them hyperexcitable. As we said before, there's always a bit of sodium that leaks into the cell, and the amount of this leakage affects the resting membrane potential of the cell. If there's very little leak, as in hyponatremia, then this voltage becomes more negative or hyperpolarized. If there's more sodium to leak, then this will leak in and make the inside of the cell more positive, so the cell is more depolarized. A depolarized cell is nearer to its threshold, so the cell becomes hyperexcited. If we think about neurons, heart cells, and muscles as being hyperexcitable, we realize that this can lead to CNS dysfunction. Cardiac arrest, as muscle can't relax, could lead to muscle cramping. This can also lead to general lethargy, as a hyperexcitable brain can become lethargic, as well as cause seizures. It's a bit unpredictable, then, how this hyperexcitability can actually manifest itself as CNS dysfunction. Lastly, then, in the proximal convoluted tubule, we're actually going to inhibit sodium-driven reuptake. If there's already a high concentration of sodium in the blood, this can decrease the ability of the sodium-potassium ATPase to move sodium from the filtrate into the blood. This is going to decrease the ability to move water to follow that sodium and decrease the ability of other substances to follow the water. Things like proteins, amino acids, glucose, vitamins, and other ions like calcium and potassium. What this means is any disturbance in sodium concentration can quickly become a disturbance of many other things like calcium concentrations, potassium concentrations, glucose, amino acids, those types of concentrations as well.